Now, uh, now I have a question here for you guys, and I'd like to hear some answers. Um, what is the purpose of having this cracking moment? Can someone help me, please? Why it is important for us to study the cracking moment? Does that tell us when the steel reinforcement takes over? Yeah. And what's the purpose? What is the main purpose? Is it to do a design for the beam? Uh, when you do the cracking moment? Is it to calculate deflections, perhaps? I've just said it like a couple of minutes ago. What's the purpose of doing this analysis for the cracking moment? <laughs> Um, isn't it for how it performs? To what? How it performs, like the bending. So to study the performance of the beam. All right, guys? Yep. OK, yes. so I want to repeat this again. And please remember this. This analysis for the cranking moment is only to study the performance of the beam. It is never intended to have a beam design. Very good. Eric? Can you help me, Eric? Eric Chu? Why do we do this cracking moment analysis? If Eric can help me, please. Uh, to study the performance. To study performance, meaning what? Like, what's the benefit of doing this? Of studying the performance? Uh, to study how well the beam can perform um, under the, the given loads. I'm okay. Guessing. Yeah, this makes sense, but let me add to this is to know when the beam is going to start to crack at what moment, right? Right. So this is not about a moment design section. This is, we are not here doing a design for the beam. We just would like to explore and see when do you think is going to crack at which moment. All right. So here we are done with the uncracked section properties. Now, if you like to do a beam design, you cannot do it with this. This is going to be for the beam design. You see this it says design, strength design. The other one, we never called it design. It is only to know when it's going to crack to start the performance of the beam, how it's going to perform. So in this case here, this is going to be used for design. In a case like this, when you're talking here the capacity, the beam has been cracked for a long time now. Cracking has occurred already, and we'd like to see the maximum capacity. What does it mean by me? This is going to be the, like the maximum moment. If you like, figure out, let's say the moment here, maximum moment that you can add this moment capacity is, let's say, 600 kilofoot. What does it mean? It means your demand, factor demand. What does it mean by factor? Factor means considering all of this load factors, right? Your maximum factor demand is going to be equal to 600 foot kilofoot. It's going to be the max. So the capacity, right? Why do we use it? Or when do you think we're going to be using it? Figure out the maximum moment that this beam can support. I'm gonna say with that includes like cracking. I'm gonna say it has nothing to do here with cracking because the beam has already cracked in an early stage when we were studying the performance. But in here, we're just looking here at the maximum moment that this beam can support without failure. So that means that the reinforcement would start assisting at this It has point. been already started some times ago okay. because the beam is gonna crack at very early stage. It's gonna show cracks right away. So now we need to study this. We need to understand what's happening there. So I'm gonna say, let me put the slide set, which is gonna be today's, which is gonna be this one here. So what's gonna happen? Same T beam that we have discussed, and this also is gonna be L beam. And I guess one of the good questions I hear is about the width of the flange. How much width should we consider? So for now, I'm going to say, I'm going to give you this width. But later on, I'm going to show you what the code says about it. Here's a beam section, the rectangular section. We call this rectangular section. D is reserved for the depth to the center of the rebars, the centroid of the three bars, if you like, because in here, it's going to be used here. And we went through this slide before, right? It's going to be the center of these four rebars. Here, D also is going to be the center of this rebar. So where is these measured from? It's gonna be from the top compression fibers of the beam all the way to here. BF usually is used for the flange width. BW stands for B of the width. 
H, total depth, B is given the width. And I guess we discussed this AS. What does it mean by AS? What does it mean by AB? AB is giving the cross section area of only one rebar. Would you find out the rebar size? Say for the rebar size. You put this one. Give us the rebar size and we have to compare it to the code. Yeah, but let's say how about in the homework, what do you do? You just use this table, right? We said that this gave be AB, cross-section area for one rebar is called AB, and we put this label here, and you guys, you have this lecture um, video, if you like, and here's the bar size. So I said, for example, I have three number seven. So you're gonna say, okay, AB for number seven is 0. 0.6. When you have three number seven, so this is gonna be three bars times 0. 0.6, it's gonna be 1.8 square inches. And we did one example like this real quick, right, in the past. So this is how you find out the S. So I said, okay, now we're gonna have some rectangular beams and some T-beams. Let me see here what happened. When the beam is gonna be deflecting this way, compression here is giving the top, tension is giving the bottom. Also, we discuss this. We say, well, this gives you like the tension side. It's gonna be, let's say, coming this way. And from the other side, I'm gonna have also a force that's gonna be coming this way. And on the top, I'm gonna have compression. So I have compression force coming this way and also compression force coming this way. They are putting compression against each other. So when you cut the section here through AA, you're gonna end up with something like this. You're gonna see here a flange on the top, which is the same also as this flange on the top, same as this flange on the top. Now the beam has cracked, right? When it comes to the strength. So I'm gonna say, here's the neutral axis after cracking. This means the bottom of the beam it's not working now anymore with me. I mean, it's cracked already. In the top, the concrete is still in compression. The concrete is gonna be working fine. Concrete, concrete is very good in compression. This is why you see this hatching. You see this hatching here, it means concrete is still active and it is getting in compression. So this here section AA, because compression the top, tension in the bottom. Now, I don't know the exact location of the neutral axis. This is why I have section, this is B and this is D. What is B and D? I'm gonna say B is happening also at AA. And also this D is happening at AA. What's the difference? Location of the neutral axis. You see where the neutral axis is at? And here's the compression on the top, tension in the bottom. Which means here, concrete here is not doing me any good. It is useless. It does mean that I can just take it out of the picture or not to put it, but it means that I cannot use it in my analysis because it's already cracked. Neutral axis here happen through the flange, through the slab. This is why you see the compression is gonna be only limited to this area. But once you take the neutral axis down, you see it's gonna be all full of compression. Now this makes sense. This is gonna be section A and section A, right? Compression and tension. Compression at the top, tension at the bottom. While in section BB, you're gonna see here tension the top. Why? Because you have negative moment. When you have negative moment, tension is giving the top, compression the bottom. Let's say here's a neutral axis, right? Now, where is the tension again? On the top, concrete here is cracked. And where is the compression? Compression is gonna be this hatchet area. So usually, if you like to show that certain area of the concrete is still working with you and it is in compression, you just hatch it this way. Now, where is the tension reinforcement? You see, tension reinforcement, it is gonna be here, it's gonna be this three bars because it's gonna be the tension side. How about here, tension reinforcement, it's gonna be this. How about here, tension reinforcement? You can see it's gonna be all of the three bars that you put in here. That's why it's easier, tension reinforcement, and then it is pointing to something there. Any questions? No, we're good. Move forward. I have a okay. question. Yes. Between B and D, are those both just if you're looking at, so if you're looking at section AA, is it whether you're looking at it on the left side versus the right side? Um, or is it both the same section? No, they are both the same, but just two different scenarios. They're the same. Okay. It depends on your analysis. So what I'm trying to say here, based on your analysis and your numbers, right? Neutral axis location could be in the flange or it could be in the width. 
Okay. So it doesn't but, matter how much it's deflected or anything. It's just no. two different scenarios. Yeah, just two different scenarios based on the numbers. Okay. You remember how we did the neutral axis here in the cracked section? Yeah. Okay, let me put it back. I'm going to put this back quick. So I'm going to say neutral axis is here. How did you come up with this 4.67? I'm going to say we did some analysis. And based on this, we we're able to find out neutral axis location. So I'm going to say something like that. I'm going to do some analysis, end up with neutral axis location. So it depends on the numbers, depends on the web width, on the reinforcing bars, on the slab thickness, and the whole thing, based on this geometry. OK. So here's what happened. A strain distribution is going to be like this. This is going to be the strain distribution. is going to be like a straight line. Now, where's the neutral axis? I'm going to say, here's a neutral axis. We don't know yet the location, but now we need to learn how to figure out the location of this neutral axis, right? Is it fine? The depth of the neutral axis, it's called here x. We're gonna be using also the term c for it, c lower case. Very common term, and so using x is gonna be c depth of the neutral axis. And you guys, you have seen this before, right, in concrete. Maximum strain in the concrete is giving the top. Here, the concrete is going to be cracked. So if you like, you can take the top section of this beam and just hatch it because it's giving compression. I'm going to say, like in here, you see this? The depth is called C, and this is giving compression. It's going to be cracking. And it's going to be cracking below it, and above it is giving compression. So again, this is going to be the strain. Anyone recalls what is the maximum strain that the concrete is going to be able to take? 0 0.003. Perfect. Who said that? Matt. What? Matt. All yeah. Right, Matt. Who said it's going to be 0.03? Where this is coming from? Yeah. Is it like by our choice or are we limited to this? by something. It's from the code, right? Yes, yeah, right here. It's going to be according to the ACI, the concrete is going to be attaining a strain, maximum strain of 0.03. Would the concrete really crack and fail at 0.03? I'm going to say no. Most likely, concrete is going to be still working there. But also, as safety, we're going to assume that the concrete is cracking here. It's going to be at 0.03. Concrete is gone, right? So this point here, the maximum and the highest value that the strain is going to be approaching here is going to be 0 0.003, according to the code. Now I'm going to put this graph. This is a relationship between the strain to the stress. And look how it looks. Let's say for 4,000, let me pick this. Where does it end? 0.03. So at 0.03, the stress is not at the highest level, it's gonna be slightly lower. At 0.02, the stress is gonna be maxed out. Between these two points, you increase the strain, you increase the stress, but it goes like in this curve. Are you guys following me in this curve? The way it looks like? Yes. Okay, so the strain at this point is zero, the strain at this point is 0.03. Let me look at this. How much is the strain at this point here? Can someone help me with this? What is the strain at this point? Zero. Zero. And the strain at this point? 0 0.03. 0 0.02. Yeah, yeah right? Oh. Let me go back here. Here is the strain of zero, the strain of 0 0.03. What happened to the stress? You can say the stress varies, like this curve thing, right? Now let me look here at the stress. You see the stress? Yeah, it varies. It looks like this diagram, isn't it? See this? You see this curve here for 4,000? Looks very similar to this guy. You start to increase the strain, the stress is gonna be increasing. And then at the end, it's gonna be reaching the maximum value of the stress at almost 0.02, correct? At the strain of 0.02, and then it's gonna start to drop down a little bit which reminds me here with this graph, exactly the same curve. 
okay, but what do you want us to do? I mean, can we do integration for this? Can we find out the volume, this distribution on this depth? We can say, no, it's going to be tough. So we can say, what is below the neutral axis? Is it tension or compression? Tension. Tension. Is the concrete good in tension? I'm going to say a little bit. You see this piece? This is stress here is going to be FR, which is the model structure. This is going to be the seven and a half is square root of F prime C. You remember this, this point? 7.5 F prime C to the 0.5. This gave you the amount of stress this gave you there. After this, the concrete is cracked. You see here the concrete? This gave you the stress distribution. No stress is gave you there. The stress is gave you only at the steel, and the steel is gave you approaching FS. Now someone's gonna say, what is FS? I'm gonna say FS is giving the stress in the steel. Like in this curve here. You remember this FS on this curve on this the y-axis, it's giving you the stress in the steel. You say, okay, how can you find out the stress in the steel? I understand how you find out F prime C, which is the highest value here, but how about this FS? You say FS, it depends on the amount of strain that you're going to have in the steel. If you know the amount of strain that you're going to have in the steel, right, you can just come here, draw a vertical line, whether it's going to be here or here, and then with that, you can figure out the amount of strain that you have in the steel. So this is how you figure out the stress in the steel because related to the strain. So now I understand this give you the strain distribution, stress distribution, and this give you the concrete and the stress strain relationship. So what is this two force here? I'm gonna say here, I'm gonna have one force and this force is gonna be right in the centroid of this weird shape, which is very tough to find. How would you do integration? How would you find out the centroid of this section here, right? I understand this gave you compression in the concrete. That's why it says here C sub C. And here, this gave you what? Tension in the steam. It's gonna be FS times AS. So I can see here this TS for tension, just T is gonna be equal to AS times FS. What is AS? Total cross section area of the steam multiplied by the stress. FS is gonna be here the tension in the steam. So you should understand that I'm gonna have compression and tension. But look at this. You have a little bit of tension in the concrete. This is why we're gonna call it here tension in the concrete. I guess someone here can simply say that C sub C equals T sub C plus T sub S. What does it mean by that? It means that this section is equilibrium. And equilibrium means total compression force is gonna be equal to the total tension force. Here's the tension force. And here's a compression force on the section. Any questions for this concept, for that, for what we are talking about here? I'd like to hear from you guys before we continue, please. Yes. It's your chance to ask. So uh, similarly, would T sub C be the area of the concrete Yes. Yeah. Multiplied by the stress of rupture, or whatever. Yeah. It it is going to be this this volume of this piece here. This volume of the stress over the width of the beam. This is correct. Um. And is that also true for a T shape to where? Yes. Um, okay. So the yeah. word in equilibrium. Yeah. Uh, okay. We're going to have. Uh, private, uh, no, no, excuse me, like a special in, in only standalone, I'm gonna say here slide sets only for the T section and how we are gonna be handling it. So. Okay, sounds good. Okay. So let's move forward. I'm gonna say, you know what? It's gonna be very tough to find out the centroid of this section. Don't you guys agree? How would you do it? And also this one, it becomes complex. I'd like to do a design. I'm not doing like a research. I'd like to do a design, so I need to make it simple. To make it simple, we're gonna have only two forces. We're gonna have one force, which is a tension in the steel, and the other force give you the compression in the concrete. How about the tension in the concrete? I'm gonna say, let's just ignore it. It's not gonna be doing us any good. It's gonna be very small and it doesn't help because the amount of tension in the steel is gonna be really high compared to this tension in the concrete. So I'm gonna ignore it. And this, 
block, this weird shape block. I'm gonna simplify it by just doing a box, this rectangle. Second. Right. So instead of having this complex distribution, we're going to simplify it. It's going to be just like a rectangle. And the stress in this case, it is not going to be equal to this Fc or F prime C, which is the maximum stress. It's going to be equal to 0.85 F prime C. So this is going to be simplification, right? The block is going to be just a rectangle. And the depth of it is not going to be going all the way to the neutral axis. It's going to be called A, compression block depth. So what is A, compression? This is the depth of this block. We call this witness stress block. This is old research that was done in the 800. In the 1800, uh, in the past, that research was made and you were able to find out this stress block distribution um, instead of having this actual distribution of the stress over this beam section. How about this compression block that we say we are gonna relate it to the depth of the neutral axis, which is the C lower case. This C lower case, we're gonna reduce it by a factor of beta one. So what is beta one? It's just a reduction factor to take it from the C to the A for the stress distribution. Now, this stress here is gonna be applied over a width of B. Now, how much is this force now? This C. This C is gonna be equal to 0.85 A prime C. What is that? 0.85 A prime C, meaning this stress on the top. But lie by beta one times C, here's beta one times C, which means it's depth, divided by the width B. So it makes sense. I understand where is this coming from. This equation is coming by just doing integration of this stress block. So here's the equation. C, compression force equals 0.85 F prime C. This gives you the stress on the top. If you look here, the stress on the top. But lie by the width B of the beam, apply by the compression block depth A, which is beta one times C. All, all of these are variables. I don't know any of them yet. At certain point, I'm gonna stop and gonna say, okay, here's what I have. Here's what I need to solve for. And in order for me to do this, I need to come up with some assumptions and then confirm that these assumptions were correct. So what is this again equals to? It's gonna be equal to 0.85. F prime C times B times A. So you can see times B times beta one C or B times A. I'd prefer this simple force. Here's the compression force. How about the equilibrium of the beam? Can you say that C is gonna be equal to T now? Okay, so yes, C is gonna be equal to T. Do I need to add this term TC? You can see, no, you don't need to. Just ignore this. So this one, just ignore it. Forget about it, we don't need it, and it is not really that critical. So I'm gonna be ignoring this tension in the concrete. And for that, I'm gonna have here C equals to T. In the past, I say T is gonna be equal to AS times FS, right? Still true, which means this C is gonna be equal to T. I'm gonna take you here, C is gonna be equal to T, which means 0.85 F prime C times B times A, like what I have here in this equation, is gonna be equal to AS times FS, the stress in this team. So, okay, now this makes sense. Now I have an idea about where I'm heading to. Let me go here back again to this slide. Now, the depth is gonna be given to you, or you can come up with it. Let's say that you're doing an actual design. You need to come up with this depth. You need to assume it. You estimate it at the beginning. You say my depth of the beam is gonna be 16 inch or 24 inch. You can just go with something there based on the building parameters, artificial design, maximum depth that you can use, right? And then you can put here this depth D or let's say for the sake of this course, I'm gonna give you the depth.
the width B also is going to be given to you. I mean, how can you work without having all of this geometrical properties? H and B and the depth D. AS, let's say for now, also is going to be given to you. So you know how much is AS. How about the concrete strength? F prime C. Material properties. I need to give it to you. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to say here, F prime C, material strength also is going to be given to you. I'll give you this. You need to come up with it. 4,000. Thank you, sir. 4,000, 3,000, 2,500. I mean, someone needs to specify it. Someone needs to come up with it. I mean, you cannot solve for it. It is something that you need to have at the beginning. You need to have the material properties, and also you need to have the section properties. What are the section properties? B and H and D, and also AS. Material properties is gonna be like this. F sub Y, concrete strength, F prime C, right? So what are the unknowns to work on this problem here? Your unknowns, if you like to go back here to this slide, is going to be the strain in the steel. You don't have it. Depth of the neutral axis, you don't have it. FS, you don't have it, the stress in the steel. So stress in the steel and the strain in the steel, you don't have any of that. You don't have, you need to calculate out. How about in here? You see, what are the unknowns? Do you have any other unknowns? You can see, yeah, beta one. I mean, how would you get beta one? C, you don't have it. A, you don't have it. But you know what? If I have C and I have beta one, I can solve for A. So these three items are related to each other. It says A is gonna be equal to beta one times C. This block stress is gonna be 0.85A prime C. I'm gonna give you A prime C so you can figure out the stress on the block. So this one is easy, consider it done. This one, I don't know yet. How can I figure this out? I say, okay, now how about beta one? Where'd you get this beta one from? Can I say from the code? Code says that this beta one, when the concrete strength is gonna be 4,000, P size is gonna be equal to 0.85. You see this graph? When the strength of the concrete is 4,000 or less, your beta one is 0.85. Also, you have this equation. It says here beta one is gonna be 0.85 when, when the strength of the concrete is 4,000 or less. This is what the code says. Also it says it's gonna be equal to 0.65 when, when the concrete strength is gonna be 8,000 or higher. Here's 8,000 and higher. How about in between? They say you can do interpolation. If you like, here's the equation for it. So beta one is like in the y axis, is going to be equal to 0.85, negative, subtracting, you have prime C. Now, this is going to be in KSI. Why? Because I put here negative for KSI. Multiply by 0.05. This is going to be the equation for this guy. So the equation for this, line for the interpolation, you can use this equation if you want to, to find out beta 1 pays on F prime C. So now let me go back. This means now I have beta 1 pays on F prime C. So once I give you F prime C, you can come here to this slide and figure out your beta one. So as you see here, I have few variables and parameters. I'm gonna start with knowing some of them, like the depth, like AS, like B, like F prime C, like FY for the steel. And I'm gonna shrink it down a little bit. I'm gonna solve some parameters. First, the stress in the block is going to be 0.85. Just take 85% of the stress, maximum stress uh, or strength of the concrete, and this gives you the stress in the block. How about this beta one? We say beta one is going to be based on this slide. So now I know how to find out beta one. Okay, so what's next? Next, I need to think here about the stress in the steam. How much is the stress is giving the steam? I'm gonna take you back to this slide set when we were talking about this. I say it depends on the amount of strain in the steam. You see the equation of this guy, of this line? 
the equation says epsilon s, which is a strain, right? At any point, is gonna be equal to the stress in the steel at any point divided by ES, the modulus of loss testing. And for the last point over this linear relationship, you can use this equation. You can say this is how you find out the yield strain, right? Which is this point here. So for now, I'm gonna say this is gonna be kind of complex because instead of giving me here the stress, you said it's gonna be based on the strain. I understand that, but now I'm gonna have too many variables, so I need to simplify it. So I'm gonna say, you know what? Our target is to have the strain in this range. So the strain is gonna be beyond the yield point. And in this case, I can safely say the stress in the steel is gonna be equal to F sub y. Just an assumption. Whether it's gonna be true or not, I can confirm it later on. So I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna say, you know what? Let me assume, assume the strain in the steel is gonna be more than the yield strain. You see this equation here? Assume, you assume that the strain in the steel is gonna be higher than the yield point. So what does it mean? It means that the stress in the steel is gonna be equal to the yield stress. This is why. As a consequence, when you have this assumption, FS is gonna be equal to FY. You're gonna be in this range. So I said, okay, now this is nice because FY is just one value. And this says gonna be six KSI, right? This is the value I'd like to use in my analysis. So if this gonna be six KSI, it means I just know the strain, the stress in the state is gonna be right here. It's gonna make my life much easier. So great. Now let me set here the tension is gonna be equal to the compression. Let me see what variables do I have? What are the missing variables? I'm gonna say 0.85 is just constant. F prime C, you have it. Am I correct? We have this. How about B? Do we have B, the width of the beam? Is it given? Yes. Given. How about A? Do you have A? I'm gonna say no, I don't have this A. This gave me my unknown. I don't have A, I don't have C, but if you give me A, I can find out C. If you give me C, I can find out A because the relationship between them is gonna be this beta one. How about AS? Do you have AS? Yeah, I have it. How about FY? Given. So where's the only unknown? It's gonna be this A. Now, can you solve for A out of this equation? You can say, yeah, because A is gonna be equal to the tension force AS times FY divided by would be five, f prime c times b. So, okay. Meaning, I assumed here that the strain in the steel is gonna be above the yield point, and therefore the stress in the steel is gonna be equal to fy, and based on this, by setting the tension is gonna be equal to compression, based on this equilibrium, I was able to solve for a. What's next after you have a? I guess you should be able to find out c. c is gonna be slow slightly higher in value than A. How do you do this? You take A divided by beta one, with that you get C. Once you have this A, can you go back and figure out the compression force? So yeah, because compression force equals 0.85, F prime C, you have F prime C. Also you have B, B was given to you at the beginning. Beta one, we have it from this chart. So I have beta one times C. I'm gonna say, yes, I just solved for C when I was able to find out A and C. Or I can say compression is gonna be 0.85 F prime C, yeah? Multiplied by the width B, multiplied by the block depth A, which I just solved for by setting this equal to each other. How about the tension force? You have the tension force, I'm gonna say, yes, gonna be AS times FY, which is the same as the compression force. So this is great, now is able to solve for all the forces. Now, where is this force is gonna be located at? Where is this point of application? It's gonna be at the centroid of this block. If this block has a depth of A, this gonna be located at A over two, one half of A. And this absolutely makes sense, right? This is here much simpler block than this distribution. I don't really need to use this distribution. Otherwise, where would you put the C? How do you find out centroid of this shape? This is gonna be a challenging task for you. So in here, it's gonna be right at A over two. As you see here, it is gonna be at A over two from the plot. 
Now, how much is the Z distance? You remember the Z distance? For the YCT distance from tension to compression, you can say from here to here is called how much is this? It's called D. And from here to here is gonna be A over two. Therefore, the tension, the distance from tension to compression is D minus A over two, which is this value here. I guess numerically, I was able to find out all of these variables. I just need the chance, I need an example to figure this out. Is it great? How about my assumption? I assume here that the steel is gonna be yielding, which means the strain is gonna be a pop of the yield strain. Someone's gonna say here, how much is the yield strain? I'm gonna say, go back to this. How much is the yield strain for grade 60? How much? 0 0.02, you remember this number? So I said, well, it means I need to go back and verify the strain in the steel and confirm it's gonna be over or higher than 0.02, which is the yield strain. I need to confirm that this is true after I solve for all of that. I say, okay, how can you solve for the strain in the steel? How do you find out this? You say, I have here two similar triangles. If you remember, we have done this in the past for this uncracked section. I can say the strain in the concrete and how much is the strain in the concrete? The max, let's say this is gonna be 0 0.003. The depth C, we just solve for the depth C. So I'm gonna say the strain in the steel here, divided by D minus C, Y D minus, here is D minus C. So I'm gonna see here the strain in the steel, I'm gonna call it ES for now. E lowercase means like this absolute, right? If you take the strain in the steel divided by D minus C, Again, what is D minus C? It's gonna be this depth D minus C, which means this height of this triangle from here to here, right? See this height. So when you take the strain in the steel divided by D minus C, this is gonna be the same as the strain in the concrete divided by C. You see, this is equals to 0 0.03 divided by C lowercase. In this equation, what do you have? What is unknown? I'm gonna say, we solve for C. We have D and C. This gave you only the strain in the steel that we need to check. Once you have the strain in the steel, what do you do? You say the strain in the steel, I need to prove it gave you more than the yield strain. And how much was the yield strain? I'm gonna say EY equals 0 0.0021. Where do you get this from? Say from here. See this equation? You take the yield strain, 60 divided by 29,000 for this specific case, unless the yield stress or strength is 75 KSI, like in this case. You remember this case here? When it is 75 KSI. So it depends on the material. If your material is 6 KSI, the strain is going to be 0.02. If your material is going to be 75 KSI, your strain is going to be 0.026. In any of these two cases, you need to confirm that your assumption was correct, which means the strain in the steel is higher than 0.02 or 0.026 bends on the grade. So, okay. How about this M sub N, the capacity or the moment, internal moment in the section? You can say it's gonna be equal to T or C multiplied by D minus over two. Very similar to what we have done before. In the cracking moment, we say it's gonna be equal to C or T. I can put this back from the cracking. Let's say, how much is the moment? If you remember this, the moment equals C or T multiplied by this Z. Same thing here. You see the moment equals C or T multiplied by D minus over two. With that, I have here the moment capacity. Which moment capacity? This is gonna be M sub N, the nominal moment capacity. Let's move forward and back check all of that. Again, strain distribution. And the top is giving 0 0.03. At the bottom is giving the strain in the steel that we can figure out and confirm. It's giving tension. Compression block. And instead of having this weird shape distribution, this is internal axis depth, we're going to have this block. It's going to be 0 0.85, depth prime C. And the depth of it is going to be equals to A applied over a width of B. All the equations that we have discussed. We assume that the section is yielding which means the steel is yielding here, the rebounds. 
Therefore, the tension equals AS times F sub one. Okay. How about the compression force? 0.85 F prime C B A. Do I have AS? Yeah, it's gonna be given to you. How about F sub Y? You have the materials. Do you have concrete strength? Yes, given to you. Do you have the B, the width? Yes, but you don't have this A. This gives you unknown. Now set T equals to C. Here's the equation. And here's to solve for your first unknown, the A there. Now we have all of that. All of these terms and variables, you have them. You have the compression block depth A, you have AS, you have F sub Y, you have F prime C, you have B. Now, how about the moment, M sub N? This is the equation we just talking about. It's gonna be equal to C or T. So in here, I use the simple form, right? Because here's the tension, here's the compression, equal to each other. AS times FY multiply by the Z distance. Distance from tension to compression, D minus over two. Like in here, you see this from here to there. D minus A over two. Or in here, is give you the depth D minus A over two. This give you your moment, your nominal moment. You say, oh, so you still have this free factor, the strength reduction factor. You can say, yes. You say, okay, here's again, the slide for the trans reduction factor. This gave me for beams. I said beams is gave you one of these two. This gave you right here. This gave you for beams and some columns. It depends on what. Why should I go with 0.9 or 0.65? It says here tension control. And here it says other enforcement or other enforced members. So I'm gonna be going here to this slide. This is the one that we started in the previous slide set, but we never finish it. So what do we have? We have the x-axis. It shows here the strain in the steel. You see this 0 0.02, 0 0.05, what is that? You can see this is, is gonna be the yield strain in the steel. This is gonna be right at the yield point. How about this one? Just a given value is gonna be 0 0.05. The y-axis, you have the phi factor. This is here for a spiral, a spiral like round columns. So I don't need to use it here. I'm gonna be just following this solid line. It means if the strain in the steel is gonna be higher than 0.05, you see the direction of this arrow, it means your phi factor is 0.5. If the strain in the reinforcing bars is gonna be lower than the yield stress or the yield strain, look at this 0.02, it means the phi factors now becomes 0.65. You can see here, if the strain is somewhere here in the middle, what do you do? You say, well, in this case, let's say this is giving this the phi factor value. You can just draw a vertical line. Once it hits this solid line, you go horizontally, and then with that, you read the phi factor. Or you can just use this equation. This equation just for interpolation between these two values. This is what the code says. In this equation here, this gonna be like the y component, the phi factor, and this gonna be the x component. And the other terms here is gonna be just constants. Any questions on the use of this graph? Is that strain value our desired strain value uh, down low where it says uh, strain equals 0 0.002? Which one? This one here? Yeah. Is that like if we want to have a strain of that value? This is, this is the actual strain in the stain. The if steel? I put the slide back, I'm going to say, you remember when I said, let me find out the strain in the steel and then based on the strain in the steel, I can figure out the stress in the steel. Uh -huh. So this gave me the actual strain in the steel. Like in here, in this case, I'm gonna take you back here. We assume that the strain in the steel is higher than the yield point. Yield point is a fixed point, which is this point here, right? Yeah. So 
the yield strain and the yield stress is like material properties. When you buy the material, you just do test on it and you can just come up with this point. But this is stress that happened in the steel, like when I have written this equation, is gonna be based on this combination of variables, not just about the steel, it's gonna be steel and concrete and the whole thing. And pays is gonna be on the neutral axis that you can figure out the actual strain in the steel. Actual strain in the steel is the one that I'm talking here about. These are just limits. 0 0.02, 0 0.05 is just two limits, but they are not the actual strain, strain in the steel. Actual strain in the steel, which means this value here, is gonna be based on this analysis. You see this analysis? You see this equation? Yeah. I was able to figure out here the strain in the steel. Based on what? Based on the concrete strain 0.03 and based on the depth C and the depth D. Got it. 0.002 is just equal to that point. But the actual strain in the steel, it can be at point to point. It can be here, it can be here, it can be here. We don't know. We need to solve for that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So now we're going to move forward to this slide. I'm going to say, well, what you need to do is find out the strain in the steel and then go to this graph. As you see here, this graph for the strain in the steel is going to be moving from this point going this way, increases this way. Why do I say that? Because look at this point here, 0 0.02, 0 0.05. So if the strain in the steel is 0 0.06, you're going to be in here, in this side. 0.09 is going to be in here. If this is going to be 0 0.03, you're going to be in this location here, right? Somewhere here. If it's going to be 0 0.01, it's going to be here. If it's going to be 0 0.02, it's going to be right here at this point. Somewhere in between, it's going to be here. And then you can figure out the fee factor. Professor? Yeah. What does it mean uh, between spiral and other? Um, spiral? You remember the spiral columns? Oh, okay. Like the round columns? Right. This can be for round sections, and this is for other sections. Okay. So when so we have a beam or a column, it's gonna be this one, like tight column, rectangular column. Uh, it's gonna be this one. It's gonna be this correct. Okay. So for now, we're gonna be concentrating on the solid line. Okay. Right. Question. Thank you. If this is the only way that you can figure out the fee factor based on it, just on the strain in the steel, I'm going to say, no, this is not the only way. We have also C divided by D. What is C? What is D? I'm going to take you back here. What is C? What is D? Here's C. How about this D? Sometimes you call it D sub T. So if you take the ratio of C over D, which is essentially kind of determining the strain in the steel, look at this. I'm going to take you back here. Look at this. When you say here C divided by D, it is the same as this ratio, 0 0.03 divided by the strain in the steel plus 0 0.03. So somehow related to it. So C over D is a ratio of the neutral axis depth to the total depth of the beam, right? The tension. This is a tension rebar. So if you go here to this axis, look at this axis. <coughs> This axis, it says here C over D. So you can do the ratio C over D here. So again, when you look here at, <clears throat> excuse me, at C over D, which is the ratio of the neutral axis depth to the total depth of the beam to the tension. And you see it increases this way. If your C over D factor is equal to 0.5, you're gonna be right here in this location because here is 0 0.6, 0 0.375. If your C over D is, let's say 20%, means that you're gonna be here and your P factor is 0.5. If your C over D is, let's say, one, means that you're gonna be here. Can C over D be equals to one at all? Let me take you back here. Can C over D equals one? 
it will never be equal to one, right? No, no. It means that there is no neutral axis. It means that the entire section is giving compression, right? If this neutral axis is gonna be somewhere here, it means here I have compression and here also I have compression, neutral axis happens here. It means strain distributions give you like this, something like this. And in this case, neutral axis give you right here, just at the extent of, and you extend this here, and you extend this here, right? Based on your analysis, you're gonna say my neutral axis give you here, which means the entire section is giving compression. This happens only in columns because you're gonna have moment and axial loop. Okay, so it's gonna be either C over D or the strain in the steam, right? Now I'm gonna go back here to this slide and try to think what does it mean when you have higher C over D versus low C over D? And would that really increase the strain in the steam? Because here's the conclusion out of this. You're saying here, I'd like to see the strain in the steel to be higher than 0.05. Why? Because it's gonna be less reduction. As if the code here is penalizing you, if you are gonna be using lower strain in the steel, they're gonna reduce the reduction factor. And this reduction factor is gonna be equals to 0.9, which you would like you, I mean, you'd like to be in this case, right? You'd like to be at 0.9. This is gonna happen when you have the strain in the steam. It's gonna be more than 0.05 and neutral axis depth to the tension depth is gonna be less than 0.375. So I'd like to know here why this is designed. What's gonna happen in this case? Can I take you back here to this slide? Let me assume here two cases. I'm gonna say here's one case. I'm gonna call it here case one. This gonna be the neutral axis location, right? Now, how the stress distribution is going to look like? I'm going to say the strain in the concrete is going to be the same, but I'm going to end up with something like this. Look at this. Now, forget about this section here. Just imagine that this could be the only section that we're looking at, right? So I'm gonna have this blue line, it's gonna be like this. Now what's gonna happen in this case? My neutral axis is gonna be where? It's gonna be right here. See that? I'm gonna call this case two. So do you want the neutral axis to be up high there at point number one and the stress distribution is gonna be like this and the strain or do you want it to be at the bottom here? In case number one, what happened? How do you compare it to this black lines that I just put there, the original of this slide? What happened? I reduced the C value. So in here, C becomes less, correct? Because mm -hmm. I squeeze C, C is gonna be from here to there. What happened to the strain of the steel? Much higher. Is this preferred? I can say yes, this preferred. This is what they call here tension control. So I'm gonna call this here to be, I'm gonna say here tension control. So it's tension control when we reduce the C. Yes, when you reduce the C and also when you increase the strain in the steam. So when C becomes a smaller, right? What happened to the steam strain is gonna be become much larger, right? And this gonna be preferred and this is what we call here tension control. So what happened at point two? For case two. At case two, C becomes much deeper. Look at C now, the C value goes from here to there. Right? What happened to the strain in the steel? It's gave you this blue line. Here's the strain in the steel, right? From here to there. So the strain drops down. So when C over D goes up, the strain in the steel goes down. If C is gonna be going down, which means smaller in value the strain in the steel is gonna get larger. And we call this compression control. This one we call tension control. Let's look here again at this. 
Let's say this is going to be tension controlled when the strain in the steel is going to be more than 0.05. Now, this explains this term here, tension control. How about compression control? I'm going to say compression control is going to happen when the strain in the steel is going to be less than 0.02. And look at the direction of increase for the strain in the steel. It goes up this way. How about the increased direction for C over D? It's gonna be happening here. And this proves the point that we just talked about. When C over D or the ratio C over D goes up, the strain goes down. When the strain goes up, C over D goes down. Let me confirm this again in here. Look what happened. When C goes down, which means this C from here to here for case number one, C over D is getting smaller, the strain in the steel is getting larger. And this is what we call here tension control versus compression control. This is gonna be tension control, compression control. In the middle here, we call transition. Now, which one you like? It seems to me that the code says, we'd like to keep in the tension control. This is why we're gonna give you the chance to use 90% of the strength. Let me go here back to this table. This table, it says tension control, 0.9. Compression control, and look at this. It says, member of the spiral enforcement. Oh, we don't have that. We don't want it, right? This is going to be for round columns. Other enforced members is going to be 0.65, which means this graph, this curve here, this chart. So physically, if I may ask here, what is the big difference between tension control and compression control in performance? Now, this is not going to be a design issue. This discussion. This is going to be about performance issue. Intention control. Look at the strain in the steam. You're going to be in here. When the beam is reaching the maximum capacity, the steel has been already yielding. Now, if you apply more load, Let's say by mistake, someone added more load to this beam. What's going to happen? The strain is going to start here. Yeah, it's going to start to collect more. Yes, this is correct. And then the strain is going to be increasing, which means more deflection is going to happen. The beam is going to deflect more. So I'm gonna look at the beam here and see the cracks and see more deflection. Now I know that something's wrong. Yeah, the stress is gonna increase and the strain is gonna increase and everything, this is true. But I'm gonna see here more deflection. I'm gonna see more cracks. So it's like warning to me. It's gonna be like warning. Something is wrong with this beam. Deformation is too much. Cracking is too much. So in a case like this, at least we can leave the place. We can run away before it collapses, right? But look at this problem here. If the strain in the steel is very low like this, what's gonna happen? You add more loads. Okay, it's gonna be moving very slow. You don't have lots of deformation, right? Deformation is gonna be very small. Deformation is gonna be very small, no warning. But all of a sudden now, the concrete is going to break first. So no yielding, no deformation. It's going to be pretty failure. So we're going to say in this case, right? I'm going to say here compression control is going to be pretty failure and it's going to be ductile failure. When you have your ductile failure, you're going to have enough warning. So you can run away. You can just take everybody out of this building and say, you cannot be in this place. But in a case like this, you're going to say, well, just gonna collapse, it's gonna be pretty failure. The beam looks good, no cracks, but all of a sudden, came down. It's not good. So for um, for the tension control, we're gonna see... Um... More deformation. Okay. Like deflection of the beam. Um, now, when it comes to earthquake, it's gonna be a different story. We don't hear design for earthquake, we do design for gravity loads, dead load and light load. Earthquake is gonna be different, different animal. So I'd like to see here warning. I'd like to see here doctor failure. I don't wanna see here compression failure. Someone's gonna say, I don't wanna see failure at all. 
I mean, I understand that no one would like to see a failure of a beam, but just in case, when do you think failure is going to happen? When you have excessive load on the beam, something that you did not design it for. Someone just keep on adding loads as a beam. You'd like to see more deformation. You don't want to see this brittle failure and compression failure. Now, this is the reason that the code comes here and say, if you're going to have this ductal failure, right? I'm going to give you here more strengths to use. This reduction factors gave you 0.9. But I'm really concerned that when you have this compression failure, this one I'm going to be reducing this fee factor for you. It's going to be very small. I don't want it to be big. And why is the reason for this? Because I'd like to give you a chance just in case if someone's going to be adding more load so you have more room for it. Otherwise, you're going to have real brittle failure. So we don't want to see this in our analysis and our design. Any questions? Would a pre-stressed member be an example of a tension controlled? A pre-stressed member is going to be completely different, but it is going to be tension controlled, yes. Oh. It's a different way of thinking, but I agree with you, yes. It's going to be tension control. Got it. Yeah. And then another question that I had was, um, would a building include both um, tension controlled and compression controlled elements? Beams, beams, right? Yes, you can have. It depends on the design. Each design can be different. And uh, in this slide set, and also in the upcoming slide set, I'm going to show you examples that for a beam that we started to design it, and we assume certain reinforcing bars, and then all of a sudden we do some changes, and then to the same beam, and all of a sudden now we changed from tension controlled failure to compression controlled failure. Okay. By just adding lots of reinforcing. So when you add lots of reinforcing, just you know, here you expect to have lots of reinforcing bars. And here again, I have less reinforcing bars, generally speaking. So when you put lots of steel, the steel is not going to be failing first. It is one of the two that needs to fail first, right? When you have excessive loads. It's going to be either the concrete or the steel. You don't want the concrete to fail first because when the concrete fails, it's going to be just brittle failure and no warning. You'd like the steel, right? To start to yield a lot. And if something to fail is going to be the steel, not the concrete. Got it. All right. Um, 